live from the Washington, D.C. area. It's the Inside Scoop, all the news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's the host. Welcome to Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Morgan Jamison. Today, we are joined by representatives from the Literacy Council of Northern Virginia. I'm going to have them introduce themselves here in a moment, but just wanted to share that they are celebrating their 60th anniversary this year, so very excited to have them. Rupal, Amy, thank you so much for joining. Thanks so much for having us, Morgan. My name is Rupal Saran, and I am the Executive Director at the Literacy Council of Northern Virginia. And thanks, Morgan. This is Amy Tristan. I'm the Volunteer and Outreach Coordinator at LCNV. Fantastic, fantastic, ladies. I, I just I'm I'm very curious to know um, about the history of the Literacy Council. Uh, what what is it that caused you all to form sixty years ago? So about sixty years ago, there was a group of interested and concerned citizens in the city of Alexandria who noticed that we had an reasonably large population of people who could speak English but weren't able to read and write. And uh, with that interest and concern, they basically started to do some one-on-one -on -one tutoring, forming the first iteration of the Literacy Council of Northern Virginia. As the years have gone by, our population here in Northern Virginia has certainly changed, and we are now serving mostly an immigrant population. We have also kind of continued to do some tutoring, but shifted mostly to classroom-based learning. And we're currently able to offer our classes in about 15 different physical locations prior to COVID and we're just building those back up and we are now also offering virtual classes. That is great. Amy, as a person who's dealing with all of the volunteers, where, where do people get plugged in? How do they find you all and, and what are you looking for as far as volunteer capacity? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so every year we work with about 500 volunteers. And for the last several years running, they have served about 18,000 hours. And if that sounds like a lot of hours, it is. It's a tremendous number of hours. Um, so they're really you know, vital to accomplishing our mission because every year we work with about 1,500 learners and we have a pretty small staff. Um, so volunteers are doing a lot for us. Um, and there's a lot of ways that they can get plugged in. Um, really, the first step is to attend one of our volunteer orientations. And I offer those sessions every month. Um, so that's where someone would come in and um, you know, take an hour long session to learn more about our programs and our volunteer opportunities. And I also share a lot of information about the students that we serve. Um, and then from there, you know, a big part of my job as the volunteer coordinator is recruiting volunteers, of course, and then getting them plugged into our program in a role that kind of meets their interests and their availability and all of that. Fantastic. So we've been experiencing a pandemic for those viewers who are not aware of what's been going on in the world for the past few years how have the volunteers been able to uh assist in uh the times that we are seeing uh today yeah yeah, so, you know, we, as Rupal mentioned, we had classes prior to the pandemic in 14 or 15 different locations. And then, of course, in March of 2020, we had to transition to Zoom platforms. And we made the decision to do that pretty quickly. Um, and we were able to do that because so many of our volunteer teachers were on board with that. They were really dedicated to our students and they didn't want them to miss any instructional time because we weren't able to physically meet in person. Um, so they kind of quickly came up to speed on how to teach on Zoom. They had never taught before on a, on a platform like that. Um, and we would meet, you know, with them two to three times a week to sort of have these instructor chats where they were sharing information about what they were doing in their classrooms, what was working, you know, so that was really wonderful. Um, so our teachers hadn't really taught online before, but they kind of quickly came up to speed. And, you know, our students hadn't really learned on on online platforms before. So that was all new to them. And we had a lot of volunteers working with individual students to try to, you know, kind of bring them up to speed and help them understand how to operate Zoom, how to click on a link and how to Zoom, join a Zoom classroom, um, how to mute themselves and unmute themselves, you know, all of those sorts of things that we've picked up over the, the past year or so. Um, so our volunteers were really crucial in helping us pivot to online platforms in the first place. Um, and then, you know, once our, our online classrooms were underway, you know, if we think back to kind of where we were in 2020, there were a lot of things going on in the world. There was a lot of information that was kind of coming at us. And our volunteers really helped our students kind of digest a lot of that information. So they shared a lot of resources. Um, you know, they shared health resources and, you know, other resources that were available to them in the community. Um, so they were really helpful in that way, too. 
sort of just maintaining that sense of community, even though we weren't able to be together. Rupal, Amy mentioned uh, transitioning to the Zoom platform as a means for educational opportunities. What does it mean for students who might have uh, disadvantages of access to uh, technologies or lack of technological understandings? How do you bridge that divide as an organization? Mentioned when we sort of made the decision to switch from in-person classrooms to virtual. On one hand, there is a benefit of some ease for some of our students. Those who may have previously had transportation concerns or childcare concerns were now finding it easier to join our classes. But for those who may not have had great access to broadband, uh, some of our opportunities were not easy for them. Fortunately, uh, we have surveyed our students and we do know that the vast majority of them do have smartphones. And while it is definitely not ideal to take an entire class on Zoom on your phone, it certainly does continue to give you access to the content. We were familiar with other organizations and other places like the local libraries that were offering Wi-Fi access, even outdoors in, in their parking lots. Um, and so we could share those resources with our students. But you are absolutely right that that was something that we needed to think about every step of the way. So it sounds like you all have a lot of great, strong community partners. Let's, uh, let's turn back the time a little bit or looking into the future. Where is it that you all traditionally host uh, the educational opportunities for your students and how do you find those locations? That one. So we are we have the real luxury of having the ability to partner with so many different organizations, not only physical locations, but other organizations that provide services that are often to the same individuals that we are serving with our English classes. As far as physical site locations, we partner with local libraries, with local schools, with community rooms in apartment complexes, with community centers, and with some of the local churches. Most excellent, most excellent. Um, this is going to be for both of you, and I'll start with Amy. Uh, what do you, Amy, think are the top five or six accomplishments that have uh, happened uh, while you've been with the Literacy Council? Um, well, you know, so we've, as Rupal mentioned, we've been around since the early 1960s, and you know, we were founded by a group of volunteers. Um, and I think it's pretty remarkable that, you know, to this day, so many of our volunteers have been with us for the long haul. You know, we have volunteers who have just celebrated their 10th, their 15th, their 20th, their 25th anniversary with us. Um, so they've been with us for a long time. And, you know, they've been with us as we sort of, you know, changed, um, you know, adopted new programs and, you know, made some pivots here and there. They've been incredibly supportive. Um, so I think that's something really incredible that I've been able to witness. Um, you know, also in the last few years, we've been able to partner with lots of um, other corporations who have done pro bono work for us. Um, you know, they've helped us with our strategic plan. Um, they've done some tech upgrades for us. Um, they've helped us in lots of other ways. Um, so I think forging those partnerships has been really key, um, you know, to our success. So I'll, I'll pass it over to you, Rupal. What else do you think? Well, certainly one of our biggest accomplishments has been the number of people that we've been able to serve. Over our 60 years, we have served nearly 60,000 learners, and we are incredibly proud of our ability to have done that across Fairfax County, City of Alexandria, Falls Church, and Arlington, and now with our virtual classes even beyond. I think one of the things that I am most proud of um, that I know that we've done throughout our history, even prior to my coming to LCNV, has always been our ability to pivot or expand or change services or change programming as needed by our learners. So if that meant that we found that there was a greater need for workforce related classes, we started to explore what exactly that meant. Did that mean that they needed help, that our students needed help with typing? Did it mean that they needed to better understand how to create an email address, draft a resume uh, and do interview skills? 
Or does it mean that we should develop a class and customize it for the actual conversations that they may have in the workplace? Say, for example, if they work in a food service related workplace, what kinds of conversations do you want them to be able to have with their customers, with fellow servers, with fellow kitchen staff and supervisors? What is American business culture or what is culture about how you interact with the people that you work with? Uh, in a similar vein, very recently, we were able to add digital literacy or computer literacy to some of our programs. Again, in recognition that this could be very helpful for some of our students. Certainly turned out to be true with us all needing to learn how to use Zoom and our computers to be able to, to interact with each other. Uh, most recently, as we are all familiar with, we've had an influx in new neighbors coming from Afghanistan in the last six months. And again, saw the need, saw that there was uh, definitely a need to help these new people being resettled in our area to speak English. And we were already in the middle of our semester when we first started getting outreach from some of the local organizations helping with resettlement. Didn't wanna have our Afghan uh, newcomers have to wait all the way till our next semester. So we went ahead and started some smaller mini classes that met once a week in kind of a conversation style to bridge the gap between when they first arrived and then they could go ahead and get registered for our next session, which just started in the last two weeks. So generally speaking, I think that's one of the things I'm really proud of has just been our ability to adapt. And I guess the, the one other thing I'd like to say is that our partnerships with the other human services agencies in our area. We have such a great relationship with so many of them. We get invited to be at the table when they are thinking about what are the needs of this vulnerable population. They know that the Literacy Council becomes very familiar with our students. We have a chance to meet with them, talk to them, see them a couple of times a week. So when it comes to gaining our insight or our input on what it is that they may need or how they are currently being served and how could they be served better, we are often welcomed to share our thoughts. And I really appreciate us being uh, invited because I do think that we have a lot to offer in that arena. Sounds as though you all are, are very plugged in with, with everything. What is the, uh, the overall general footprint that you consider to be Northern Virginia? When, when discussing the Literacy Council of Northern Virginia, what does that look like and how do you define that footprint? Right now, we define that footprint physically as Fairfax County, Arlington County, Falls Church, and the city of Alexandria. However, the opportunity to offer classes virtually has really allowed us to expand significantly. Uh, for example, we had some of our students during the pandemic who decided to return home to their countries, but continued in their English classes. And additionally, we had a lot of our volunteers who have moved, they've chosen to move to other parts of the country as they retire, or they came to us and actually applied for jobs with us now from other parts of the country because they knew that they could teach with us virtually. So we now like to say that we're really serving somewhat a global population. That is most excellent. Now, Amy, what is a way that the students uh, find you all as an organization? What type of outreach do you do or who do you partner with to find those students uh, to get them plugged in? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think our students find us from a number of different channels. Um, I'm sure that many of them will just, you know, do an internet search for English classes near me and LCNV is one of the first things that will come up. Um, but I think that a lot of our students hear about us just from word of mouth. Maybe they know a student who took a class with us and that other student has shared information with them. Um, or of course, you know, because we do so much outreach in the community, a lot of caseworkers, social workers, um, you know, folks who work with different clients in different capacities are familiar with LCNV in these programs and might share that information with English learners that are kind of in their caseload. Um, we also have a lot of volunteers who do outreach for us. So they might go into the community and put flyers in different locations that are kind of high traffic areas, um, or they will go to libraries in their neighborhood and just kind of, you know, develop a connection with some of the library workers who are there. Because a lot of English learners might go to their public library first and just find out more about English classes in the area. And if those librarians are familiar with LCNV, they're more likely to share information with those folks who walk in. Um, so there's a lot of different things that we do. Um, you know, I'm also 
um, on different teams and go to different um, events in the community where I'll set up a table and just give out information. Um, you know, back in the, the the summer of 2021, I did a lot of in-person back to school resource fairs where I would set up a table and give out flyers. And I know that there was one in Alexandria not too long ago where we gave out hundreds of flyers about our program. So, so we try to kind of, you know, um, look to all those different sources and try to give out information wherever we can, um, knowing that we just, we don't know like sort of how far out those, those circles go and how, um, to the extent that um, people will share information about our classes. Most excellent. Rupal, uh, moments ago you mentioned um, working with the uh, Afghan population, the refugees who have resettled to the area. At what point uh, during the uh, refugee resettlement were you all brought in or did you all step up to, to get involved? Was that working it with the federal level, the state level, the local level? At what point in that equation was it brought to the attention that you all are going to be a fantastic resource for them. Morgan, thanks for that question. Uh, I actually should say that we have had the opportunity to work with Afghan, the Afghan community for several years. And I think um, we were initially contacted by the city of Alexandria, who had a large number of newly resettled Afghans in the last five or so years, and asked us if we would be willing to create an English class to serve that population, and ideally an intense English class. In other words, our typical English classes meet about four to six hours a week, but we developed for this population a class that is what we call our intensive class and meets 16 hours a week, four days a week, four hours a day. It was um, a, a variety of organizations that came to know about that class that I think really helped us to be primed and in the right space to be considered to assist when this most recent group of refugees um, have come to, into the area in the last six months or so. So we have worked with the resettlement agencies like Lutheran Social Services, like Ethiopian Community Development Council, as well as working with the Workforce Development Centers and some other local nonprofits that have been founded by uh, churches and other individuals to serve this population. We've done a nice job spreading the word. We have a dedicated outreach manager who is out there telling people, you know, that we do provide this service and people come to know. I We get calls literally every single day right now um, from people saying, I met one person, I met a family uh, and they would like to join your classes. Excellent. Amy, you know, going to to reach out and, and talking to these individuals and, and teaching these uh, these classes, are there any requirements of your volunteers, multi-language individuals or uh, educational levels? What is it that it takes to uh, ensure the success working with uh, different populations? Yeah, it's a good question. So it's important for volunteers to be over the age of, teen, of 18. So they need to be adults and they need to speak fluent English. Um, you know, beyond that, we offer a lot of training and support for anyone who wants to get involved with us. I would say that a lot of our volunteers do have a background in education. You know, many of them were teachers um, or are teachers and they want to get involved with serving adult learners. Um, you know, we have a number of folks who are retired foreign service and, you know, they have traveled all over the world and many of them speak multiple languages and they want to kind of continue serving an international population. So they'll get involved with us as volunteers. Um, it's not required for someone to speak another language in order to get involved with us because, you know, our class is a really kind of an immersion experience for students because we have, of course, students who are speaking all sorts of different languages and they're all together in one classroom, all trying to learn English together. So we really encourage them to speak as much English as possible. Um, so it's sometimes helpful if a volunteer does have some other language abilities. They might be able to understand something if a, if a student isn't understanding a certain vocabulary word or a certain concept. If that volunteer happens to speak that language, that could sort of help things along. Um, but I would say more than anything, I think it's really helpful when we have volunteers who speak other languages because they can really empathize with how difficult it can be to speak another language. They can understand, especially as an adult trying to you know, acquire a second or a third language, um, it's really challenging. And I think that they can sort of put themselves in the shoes of those learners and understand what it takes, how much practice and dedication it takes to learn that language. Um, so it's not a requirement for, for volunteers to be able to speak another language. It can be helpful. Um, and we certainly do have a lot of volunteers who are multilingual. 
And we'll, you know, use those volunteers in different capacities, especially if we need to communicate with a student who's at a very beginning level. If that student has some questions about our program, sometimes it's easier to communicate through a volunteer who speaks that student's language, um, just to be able to fully answer all of their questions and give them the information that they're looking for. Um, but we, you know, are glad to really engage so many volunteers who have so many different skills um, and they're able to use those skills that they have, those resources they have to support the learners in our community. And follow up question to that, are your volunteers um, all in the classroom education environment or are there opportunities to help around the office administratively out in the community? What are those different opportunities if somebody might not feel comfortable or uh, up to the task or challenge of um, you know, teaching in the classroom setting? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of our classroom volunteers um, that kind of makes up the bulk of our team, I would say. So we have volunteers serving as teachers and class aides and tutors. Um, but we also have a fantastic team of volunteers who serve as student advisors. And they are kind of like mentors for a lot of our higher level students to kind of talk them through what our classroom offerings are and where they might go after LCNV. Um, and you're right, we have a lot of volunteers who serve with us behind the scenes. Um, so we have a regular team of volunteers who come into our office every week to help us with things like data entry, um, answering the phone, corresponding with students, um, doing material prep, lesson material prep, things like that. Um, so those volunteers are really, really key as well. Um, and of course, we have a lot of in-person options and virtual opportunities. So we've been able to engage volunteers who don't even live in this area. You know, they were volunteering with us for a while and they've moved away and now they can re-engage with us. So as Rupal mentioned, you know, we have volunteers who are in California and in Europe and things like that doing some virtual projects for us, which is really exciting. Um, so, yeah, there's there's just a lot of opportunities. Um, and I'll say, you know, this is it's been really exciting, especially during the pandemic when people were so kind of isolated, especially in the beginning. We had a lot of volunteers who reached out to us because they were quarantined in their home, but they wanted to engage with people and they wanted to serve their community in some way. And they heard that we had virtual volunteer opportunities. Um, so we were able to connect with and engage a lot of volunteers last year. Um, and I'm really glad that they have stuck with us and, you know, will continue volunteering with us, you know, hopefully for many years to come. Fantastic. Now, Rupal, for an organization to have been around for as long as you all have and making the impact that you all have made in the community, I'm assuming it's not just um, volunteerism uh, with your staff on you know, various uh, advisory boards for our communities. Have you all received any type of recognition or, or what are some of those highlights um, that you all have received over the uh, past history of the organization? You know, I think as with any nonprofit, there has to be such an amazing combination of finding the funding and knowing how to apply for that funding, of having the volunteers, of course, of being able to publicize your programming and the opportunity to be recognized for finding the right combination of that is really something that is so special. And so we were most recently recognized this month with by Leadership Fairfax with the 2021 Nonprofit Leadership Award. Uh, we were incredibly honored to be among a really fantastic group of organizations and individuals who are recognized for their work in the community, both during COVID and in the sort of the months <laughs> most recently. So that is our most recent um, award. Well, congratulations to you. That is most fantastic. Before we get to our break in the first half here, um, another two-part question or, or question for both of you rather, what is it and, and how is it that you measure success of the organization? This time I'll, I'll start with Rupal. How do you measure the success? I think first and foremost, we want to know that we are serving the number of people in the community who need our services. So we are constantly looking for people, for sources for people, for being able to connect with those people and get them connected to our programs. I also think that it is a sign of success to see how much our learners learn. So we give every student that comes to us a pretest at the beginning of their session with us and then a post test at the end of the session. And we, of course, need to track and want to track how it is that they're doing, both to make sure that our programs are serving them well, uh, but also to make sure that once they leave us, they are better off than when they first came. And I think it's 
just keeping our client or our learner, our student, first and foremost in our minds and thinking about the best way to serve them that is a good sign of our success. And I think I would come at this question from the perspective of, vol of a volunteer coordinator. Um, and I think that a sign of our success is just the extent to which we can kind of retain so many of our volunteers semester after semester. You know, they continue teaching with us. Um, they continue serving our learners. They tell their friends about LCNV and the volunteer opportunities that we have. Um, you know, we have volunteers who serve with us every semester. And then at the end of the semester, we survey them to see if they'd like to continue or if they want to try a different role. And we always ask questions about, you know, what their experience has been and what they found most fulfilling. Um, and a lot of them will say, you know, incredibly glowing things about the support that they've received, but also the connections that they're able to make with students and how rewarding and fulfilling that is. Um, so I think that 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 is a good feeling, you know, to, to make sure that we can connect these volunteers with meaningful experiences and to know that it's sort of, um, you know, ticking the boxes, it's making them feel connected to the community and, um, and it's, they know that they're having an impact. So I think that's huge. Excellent, excellent. Volunteers being the lifeblood of the organization serving the, uh, the populations and making sure that they are, are getting out of it what, what they want to as well as putting into it. Um, so before we come up to our break, I do want to give an opportunity for you all to share some contact information or your websites or some basic information here in the next, uh, minute, just, uh, to let folks know where they can find you and, uh, how they can get engaged. Our website can be found at www.lcnv.org, and there you can click on a learn section to learn about our class offerings and a volunteer section where you'll get more detail about our upcoming volunteer opportunities and how to connect directly with Amy about your interests. Most fantastic. Thank you, Rupal, for, for sharing that. Um, as, we, uh, as we approach um, the uh, coming out of the pandemic, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of interesting things that you all are considering um, working on. I know that there's uh, several events that you have coming up and definitely want to highlight those in the second half of the show. So I hope our, our viewers stick around um, for that. So excited to have you all on here and sharing your story of the 60 year anniversary that is the Literacy Council of Northern Virginia. So uh, stick with us. Uh, we'll be back here soon. Again, we've been joined by Rupal and Amy from the Literacy Council of Northern Virginia, sharing with us the 60 year history of uh, what they've been doing and what they have uh, coming up in store for us in the future. So thank you so much and look forward to continuing this conversation. <laughs> Maria, so how's work? It was fourth period biology. Our students just weren't getting how easily viruses spread. So Miss Bell and I had them role play a zombie virus outbreak. By the time they had all learned the lesson, all the living were dead. Hey, how's your job going? That big sales meeting I planned? Next year, I might get to go. <clears throat> cool. Freedom, it's at the core of who we are. The freedom to live without fear, to jog where we please, to wear a hoodie. The freedom to breathe. Before we celebrate the freedom most Americans have, we must fight for the freedom all Americans deserve. Because all lives can't matter until black lives matter. When I was your age, I was just like you, fascinated by stars. Ugh. But now I get to search for life in the universe. And who knows, maybe life is looking for us too. So we're like aliens to them? Yeah. Does anyone want to be a scientist now? I do. Awesome, we need more girls in STEM. Maybe we can find aliens. For. 
Your blood pressure numbers could change your life. Talk to your doctor about creating a plan that works better for you. Start taking the right steps at manageyourbp.org. I'll never forget the day our landlord called and said, read your lease. No pets allowed. My owner tells him my dog ate the lease, but that didn't work. And now I'm stuck in a shelter. But this pit bull is ready for a new crib. I'm loving, loyal, and play well with others. So don't be intimidated by all my muscles, because the biggest one I have is my heart. <laughs> That's right, I said it. We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back to Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Morgan Jamison. We're joined by uh, representatives from the Literacy Council of Northern Virginia, Rupal and Amy. Thank you so much uh, for joining us and sharing with us the story of your 60-year uh, history and accomplishments and the future to come. Really appreciate your time today. Um, I'm, I'm going to start with um, a question that I had that was going into the break. Um, Rubel, if you could possibly field this one. What upcoming events do you all have? Um, what are some of the things that you all do outside of educational opportunities? Any ceremonies, uh, anything of that nature? Yes, typically in a year, we host two major events, and one of them is actually coming up in a month. It's, a, it's four weeks from today. It is our A Taste of Literacy fundraising breakfast. We did that event for the first time in 2019, and it was a fantastic virtual, excuse me, a fantastic in-person event uh, held in Tyson's at the Doubletree Hotel, one of the sites that we've actually taught an English class there for the employees at that hotel site. But it was our first fundraising breakfast, and we had a wonderful group of attendees and some fantastic remarks from several of our past students, some of their supervisors speaking about their accomplishments. We aim to do the same thing again in 2020 and 10 days before the event, we needed to switch it to virtual. Um, we had a very successful 2020 event in 21. We decided to do it virtual right from the beginning. That was also a fantastic event. And this year in honor of our 20 excuse me, in honor of our 60th anniversary, we are thrilled to be able to do that event in person again. It will be on March 25th in the morning. Breakfast event will be up on our website. And uh, we are looking forward again to getting the opportunity to share some of the stories of our learners. We also hold every year what we call our annual recognition ceremony. It's always held in June. Uh, held as sort of an opportunity to celebrate the end of a school year, if you will. But we also rec so we recognize our students, we recognize volunteers of the year, partners of the year, and a lot of our supporters for the year in a purely recognition style event uh, where we really celebrate all that we've accomplished. And we will hold that this year on June 22nd and are looking forward to sharing a, sort of a a little bit of a bigger event than normal to remark on our past 60 years and examine what things are going to look like for us in the future. Most excellent. And, and a follow-up question here. Can you please, Rupal, familiarize our audience with the, the mission of the Literacy Council of Northern Virginia? I think that would be helpful for them to understand what you all are trying to accomplish. Absolutely. So the mission of LCNV is to teach adults the basics of reading, writing, speaking, and understanding English so that they can access educational and employment opportunities and more fully and equitably participate in the community. That's most excellent. And, and I loved hearing earlier about that going beyond just the mission and, you know, really helping people with resume workshops and, and other skill sets and things. Amy, what would you say are some of um, the, um, you know, unique successes of the organization um, from your lens? What are some of those things that, that um, really stand out to you? Yeah. Yeah. It's been, so I've been with LCNV for four years and it's been really neat to track with so many students who have come through our program and who can later report that they have, you know, been able to get a job in their field or they've been able to accomplish their goal of gaining citizenship or whatever it is. Um, so I think that's really exciting. And, you know, it's, it's always really interesting when students kind of go through our program and then they turn around and they reach out to me and ask if there's anything that they can do as a volunteer because they want to do more to support their 
their community and you know more to be involved. Um, and that's always really exciting. A, it's really exciting to engage them as volunteers, but B, it's really exciting to have more voices in our classroom. Um, so it's exciting for the students who are in that classroom to see someone who has walked the path that they are on and is just some you know, a little bit ahead of them. Um, so I think that's inspiring to a lot of our students. Um, and I think it's really satisfying to our students um, who have gone through our program when they can kind of look back um, and they can see everything that they have learned and they recognize that they have so many skills that they can offer to others in the community as well. So I think that's really exciting. Most excellent. Um, you know, the, the nonprofit world constantly is considered, you know, that labor of love and giving things back. I want to give you both an opportunity to share what you personally find rewarding about the work you are doing. Uh, Rupal, do you want to answer that first? Yes. Uh, I will tell you one of the most rewarding things for me is when we are in that annual recognition ceremony. What we typically do every year is we ask our teachers to pick an essay topic or we pick an essay topic and ask our teachers to encourage our students to write essays. It might be something like English has empowered me too, or my, you know, I shining the light on my work allows me to, and it's a prompt that our students can respond to. We then select a couple of the students to read their essays in front of the entire audience at our annual recognition ceremony. So not only are they in front of a large group of people, they are speaking in English in front of a large group of people. We see these students get applause, standing ovations, and what is and that is incredibly meaningful and exciting and, and very emotional, actually. And what is equally exciting is when the event is over and their own family members, people who they live with, come up to them. And it's a child of a mom who's in our class or it's the spouse of, you know, a spouse who's in our class. Um, it, last year, it was the daughter, a grown adult daughter of a woman who was in her 60s who were in our classes. And these family members are floored. They say, I never knew that you could speak English so well. And I think that moment of pride within a family is probably one of the most beautiful things for me to see. Excellent. And, and Amy, same question to you. What do you find most rewarding about this work and fulfilling uh, and why you continue to, to be in this field? Yeah, there are a lot of things that are, are really um, great about working in this field. Um, there are a lot of th great things about working with this particular team that LCNV has. Um, I am, you know, blessed to have the opportunity to work with 14 of some of the most hardworking individuals I've ever known in my life. Um, they're incredibly dedicated to their work. They work very hard. Um, they're really focused on the mission of LCNV. Um, and they bring so many interesting skills to the table um, that it's just a really exciting work environment. Um, and I have to give RuPaul a shout out. Um, she was selected as one of the 2022 honorees for the Washington Business Journal's Diversity in Business Awards. Um, so we're going to be celebrating that award later in March. Um, but she was given this award for being an incredible leader in the field. Um, so I just feel very honored to work with her and with all of our colleagues. Um, but in terms of other, you know, sort of rewarding aspects of this job, um, you know, I, I really enjoy tracking with the students and seeing them progress through our program. Um, you know, both Rupal and I are trained to give pre-tests and post-tests to our students. So we assess them at the beginning of the semester and then we measure their progress at the end. And, you know, when we're meeting a student for the first time to give them that pre-test, sometimes they're a little bit timid about speaking English. Um, they might not have a lot of confidence in their abilities. Um, but over the course of a semester, you know, when we see them at the end, we're able to see how much progress they're able to make. And, you know, often they're very excited to sit down with me again and to demonstrate everything that they've learned. So that's that's a really fun part of the job, um, you know, but they're there are a lot of, um, you know, I guess I would say in the four years that I've been on staff, it's gone really, really quickly, but I've had a number of kind of full circle moments, I would call them. You know, when I first started, um, you know, I remember there was one student in particular who was from Vietnam and she started in our level one class. And then she kind of made her way through our program. She took level two and then she took level three and then she took our writing class. And I remember when she was studying for the citizenship exam. And I remember when she passed and I remember going to the swearing in ceremony um, and watched her walk across the stage. And it was an incredible moment. Um, and then just a few weeks ago, um, her daughter, who's now a young adult, reached out to me 
and kind of gave us an update on her family and was able to share a little bit of the impact that learning English had on her mom's life and on the life of their family. Um, and this daughter wanted to know if there was some way that she could give back, if there was some way that she could get involved with our program as a volunteer. Um, and, you know, of course, we would love to have her. So, you know, I've had a number of those sorts of experiences, which, you know, add up. Um, and that's just incredibly rewarding to see the progress of our students, to see them achieving their goals, and to know that we played a small part in that. That's awesome to hear that type of success story. And, and Rupal, congratulations on your award. Um, that is really great and, and such a high honor. Um, you all are doing some fantastic stuff. I'm, I'm glad to hear that recognition is, is being given to the organization and to the individuals that make it up. Amy, you mentioned um, different levels of class in the pre and post test. Um, how many different levels do you have? What are the what are the ways that you make those assessments and, and you know, what kind of tracks do you, do you put your students on? Um, can you walk us through that a little bit? Yeah, we have several different programs. So we have a beginning English program and those classes are offered on three levels, um, level one, level two and level three. So that ranges from very beginning to a kind of high intermediate. Um, and then we have some skills based classes. We have writing classes, we have conversation classes. Um, those classes are a little bit more intense um, and focused on those specific skills that learners might want to kind of add um, and then we have our destination workforce program. Um, so there's a couple of versions of that program, but in one version, we're working with um, organizations that have clients who are seeking employment or they're looking to kind of move up in their field. Um, so we're working with those agencies to prepare a class that makes sense um, for the learners in that context. Um, and then we also partner with other businesses who have learners on staff, um, maybe housekeeping staff or um, banquet staff, things like that. So we we've partnered with hotels and restaurants um, to bring these classes on site to work with some of the employees that that employer has who want to learn English in order to to um, be more um, kind of plugged into that working environment. Um, so there's a number of different programs that all kind of run simultaneously. Um, and we always assess a learner when they come in to register for our program so that we can put them in the level that makes um, that's appropriate for them. Um, so they might start at the very beginning or if they're kind of a more intermediate student to begin with, we might plug them in at a higher level um, and then they go from there. That's awesome. and and. Rupal, when it comes to, uh, you know, I clearly have now learned that uh, you are helping to facilitate some of those tests, but when it comes to the brainstorming and the ideas of how you can create new programs, can you walk me through where you get these ideas as well as some of the, the new programs that you have going on or the, the hopes and dreams that you have for programs in the future? So when we, you know, we, we know we can teach English, we know we can teach you vocabulary, we know that we can teach you how to conjugate a verb or form a sentence. But when we think about teaching English more broadly than that, it becomes sort of, you really need to get to know your community. So for example, we have had an opportunity to work with Alexandria Park and Rec Department. Uh, some, in some cases, they have staff members mostly uh, working on landscaping and taking care of their parks who have been with them for quite some time. And uh, the department felt like, you know, these are trusted, long standing employees of ours. We want to provide them with a service that might be beneficial to them in the job, but even outside the job. In the job, it would be great if they can speak with park goers, explain to them what's happening, maybe politely tell them not to walk in this area and go ahead and walk in that area or explain what's being planted. But more broadly than that, wouldn't it be wonderful if an employer supported their employees in a bigger or greater part of life or as part of our mission states to help them more fully and equitably participate in the community? So it is looking for organizations that have that priority or that interest in serving their employees that we have found another kind of a sweet spot in terms of new programming. So in that same vein, we have gone to a restaurant group and asked them, Alexandria Restaurant Partners, and asked them, would you be willing 
to offer an English class for your students. And we were able to do that last fall. It was actually intended to be done uh, right as the pandemic struck in 2020 and of course got postponed and we were able to do it in person in fall of 2021. It turned out to be a wonderful class. We also um, were reached out to by the Opportunity Neighborhood Program in Fairfax County, which is a program that has a designated five different neighborhoods as sort of areas where they would like to put some additional focus and make sure that all the various resources that are available from the services that are provided to citizens in those areas, to the school system, to the community centers are all working a little bit more in tandem um, and making sure to spread the word about what services are provided by the county to the residents living in those areas. The county does a tremendous job of providing services and trying really hard to make sure that people know about those services. But among our students, People are coming from 90 different countries speaking 50 different languages. So I can only assume that Fairfax County is sort of similarly serving a large, if not larger population than that, meaning from diversity standpoint. So while they may be providing all these amazing services, uh, they need to, and they may say, we're putting it into eight different languages in our flyers. Um, we want to make sure that that information is actually getting out there. So the Opportunity Neighborhood Program through Fairfax County, through the Neighborhood and Community Services Department, uh, came to us and said, can we offer an English class specifically for residents in these five communities with a specific focus on building this student ambassador or leader ambassador program. So while teaching English, we are also specifically focused on the services that the community, or excuse me, that the county provides and making sure that information about those services is getting out to all the different diverse communities that we have. In addition to that, there was a real keen interest in educating some of these citizens in these services and then inviting them to join some of the county's boards, advisory commissions, uh, and so forth to become leaders and be able to voice what they're seeing um, in their community. So this win-win-win uh, situation where, you know, we're the nonprofit, we of course need support to be able to continue to provide our services, but the the winners really are our students who are getting the services, but also the organizations that are recognizing that if we can marry the needs of the students with the students, we could actually give them so many more opportunities to be bigger in our community. That sounds like you all really approach things with a holistic view of not just what you all can accomplish, but also how you can uh, leverage those partnerships both with the local government and with uh, other organizations out there and make sure that they are receiving um, that, that holistic approach. One of the things that I think comes up frequently um, when talking about nonprofits, especially those with um, strong relationships with uh, government entities are um, quite frankly, uh, common misconceptions. And I wanna give you both the opportunity, starting with Amy, to identify some of those misconceptions that are out there and, and also set the record straight. Amy, is there anything you wanna share and then we can kick it over to, to Rupal to uh, address that as well? Yeah, well, I don't know if it's a misconception, but I think it's just interesting information um, that, you know, as Rupa mentioned earlier, we have learners who come from 90 different countries, they speak 50 different languages. It's just an incredibly diverse group of people. Um, and they've had a wide range of professional and educational experiences. Um, so many of our students have master's degrees or professional degrees from their home country. Um, some of our learners have very little formal education at all and are kind of learning to read or write for the very first time as adults. Um, so there's just, there's every person is different. Every person has a different journey. Every person has a different story. Um, and I think we're really good at sort of, you know, unpacking those stories and getting to know our students through the work of the volunteer teachers that we have in our classrooms. Um, but I would offer that and then I'll kick it over to Rupal. Yeah, one of the things that I think is a misconception is that a lot of us don't, didn't, or before I came to work here, didn't really realize the number of people in our community that don't speak English. You know, I don't come across them all the time, partly because they're not as interested in, in being out in 
you know, places where they're interacting with those of us who only speak English. Um, but I would have never known that 51% of the students in Fairfax County go home to a house where English is not the main language spoken. Um, and it is only when I have, you know, gotten to know my students and then seen them at my children's schools in the county where I have just come to realize how much they really are right here. It's not like they live way over there. Um, They're right here in my neighborhoods. Um, and I think that is a big misconception that we just don't even realize the number of people that have lived here, some for a few months um, and some for many years um, without learning English. I think that sometimes people think that, or they don't realize that we predominantly serve adults and we do our adult learners. So say last year we had about 1400 learners and they were the parents to more than 1200 children. So while we technically serve mostly adults in our classroom programs, we do like to say that we are impacting the lives of a lot of children as well. Absolutely. I, you know, the, the knowledge and information that your students are learning, they can also be passing along or, you know, helping and, as you mentioned earlier, becoming leaders in, in their communities. Um, one of the other things that I'm personally curious about is what the, um, we, we talked earlier about your kind of timeline of things. What, how many uh, different uh, cohorts or sessions of students do you do? Is it one annually they have to apply at the beginning of the year? Um, and, and you know, how do you find those? Not how do you find them, but uh, how many people do you do you go for at any um, given time? Not sure who really wants to, to field this as far as your calendar schedule and also how you're filling um, your, your slots. But uh, during the break, you mentioned you had several people uh, that you, you enrolled this past month. Uh, would either of you like to, to ex expand on any of that uh, there? Sure, I can take that one. So we typically offer our classes in a semester style fashion. So we have a 12 week fall semester and then a break and then a 12 week spring semester, then a break and then a shorter eight week summer semester. We do registrations at the beginning of all of these sessions and we hold our registrations both in person at all the physical sites where we're going to hold classes, but then more recently have offered offer, also offered an entirely virtual way of being registered for our classes. And this spring, or this session that just started two weeks ago, we were absolutely floored to have over 585 people uh, register for our classes. Well back to our numbers prior to the pandemic, which is very, very exciting. And interestingly, um, about half and half in terms of those who are taking our in-person classes and those who are taking virtual. One of the things to note though, is that a few of our in-person sites are still not 100% back and running. And we certainly hope that they will be back in the fall. It is very much our intention to be back in all of those sites. Although at that point we are going to figure out, have to figure out how with this mighty but tiny staff of 15, uh, we go through this registration process. Nonetheless, it is our aim to try to make it as easy as possible for people to get registered. Um, that said, based on the variety of grants that we get and the types of information that our funders want us to collect, um, it isn't easy to fill out our registration form if you don't speak much English. So we are always counting on volunteers to help us out at all of these registrations, whether they're bilingual volunteers actually helping people fill out the forms or just helping us to direct traffic. Um, everything's been a little bit more complicated because of COVID in terms of needing to keep people distanced, needing to keep people masked, trying to have people waiting, you know, a little bit separate from each other. And then certainly our, our virtual process, I mean, it is very hard to fill out that form when you don't have a person there to help you, uh, when we're only really there able to help you over the phone. But to answer your, your one other thing I just wanted to say, Morgan, is that we are offering 51 different courses uh, this semester. That is extremely impressive, including hearing the uh, the numbers of folks that you have enrolled for this semester. 
Amy, you previously mentioned doing the uh, intake and you and Rupal both being uh, certified to do that. How many of your team of 15 are doing that intake? Do you have volunteers? How long does each intake take? I have so many questions about how you were able to process that many people for this semester. Uh, please uh, in enlighten me. Yeah. Yeah, it is a lot because um, it's a one on one speaking test that we give to our learners to assess kind of what their English level is. Um, and so everyone on staff is trained to administer this test. We use the best plus assessment tool. It's developed by the Center for Applied Linguistics. It's a nationally recognized assessment tool. So everyone on staff is trained to use this tool. And then we also have a team of volunteer testers who also go to registration events and they test students one by one. Um, and they also do post testing for us at the end of the semester. So they go out to those class sites and they test those same learners again. Um, so we have trainings for that sort of volunteer role several times a year, and we're always looking for volunteers to join our team of testers. It's a pretty flexible role because testers can sign up for a shift to conduct those assessments at a certain time or place that's convenient for them. Um, and so they can serve several times a year and engage with our learners, but it's not you know, a big commitment over the course of a semester. It's sort of, they're able to serve here and there. Um, so yeah, it is, it is a big role. Um, I think it's, as I've mentioned, it's a really fun way to interact with students and kind of hear a little bit about their story and where they're from and what their interests are and things like that. Um, but it's you know one of those volunteer roles that we are currently recruiting for. Um, so if anybody might be interested in joining that team, um, I would love to talk to you about that opportunity. Fantastic. And, and following up on that, Amy, what is it when somebody reaches out and says they want to volunteer? What is that experience like when you're doing a volunteer intake and, and how you're getting them plugged in? Yeah. So about once a month or so, I conduct volunteer orientations. We call them LCNV 101. Um, the next orientation will be on Wednesday, March 16th at 7 p.m. So it's a one hour Zoom session. Um, and so we like for volunteers to start there so they can sort of get the big picture of everything that they were doing, um, you know, hear more about volunteer roles and start thinking about where they might plug in. Um, so that would be that would be great. You know, if folks want to come to that, they can just contact me directly to RSVP for that event, and then I can share the Zoom link with them. Um, but again, the date is Wednesday, March 16th at 7 p.m. on Zoom. Most excellent. Uh, sadly, we are coming to uh, the end of this uh, show, but I definitely want to have you both back on uh, in the near future. Um, I want to give you both an opportunity, any parting words that you may have for our audience. Um, you know, let's start with Rupal, then Amy, you can uh, wrap it up. I just want to thank you so much for having us. We are thrilled to be celebrating our 60th anniversary this year. For anyone interested in learning more about what we do, we'd love to see you at our annual A Taste of Literacy fundraising breakfast on Friday, March 25th. And you can go to our website to get more information on that. Yeah, and I, I hope that we have been able to share a little bit about the students that we work with, the incredible volunteers that we work with, um, you know, the staff that we have the privilege of working with. Um, and I, I hope that, that you know, by, by coming on and sharing this information, you know, it can sort of become spread around the community and folks who are interested in getting involved with us will contact us. Um, those who hear about our classes will share that information with English learners in their neighborhoods um, or, you know, folks that they are connected with. Um, so I just really appreciate the opportunity, Morgan. Thanks for having us today. Absolutely. Rupal, Amy, thank you so much for joining. Uh, this is Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Morgan Jamison. So happy to have been joined by the Literacy Council of Northern Virginia today. <laughs>